This video is about a classic problem in computer science known as the dining philosopher's problem. It's a fun little problem that teaches a bit about the concepts of deadlock and starvation, quite literally. Because the concept is that we have a table and around it are seated five philosophers. Now, a philosopher's life is spent alternating between periods of contemplation and periods of eating. They need sustenance every once in a while. So in front of each of these philosophers is a plate. And in the center of the table, they get an infinite supply of spaghetti, which I'll represent with these squiggly lines. Unfortunately, there are only five forks at this table. Now, the conceit of this problem is that a philosopher requires two forks at the same time in order to eat spaghetti. Some have argued that this problem makes more sense if you give them chopsticks rather than forks, but the classic formulation uses forks, and that's what we'll use. So philosophers think for a while, and then they grab forks and eat. However, each fork can only be used by one philosopher at a time. That means we have mutual exclusion. Additionally, we don't allow philosophers to take forks from other philosophers. Therefore, we have no preemption. Lastly, if a philosopher grabs one fork, but the other fork is not available, then that philosopher will keep holding on to the first fork until the second one becomes available. That means we have a hold and wait condition. All in all, this means we have the potential for deadlock. In fact, we're going to look at some incorrect code that leads to deadlock, or at least has the potential to lead to deadlock in this problem. That code looks like this. So in this code, we have an array of semaphores named fork. There's one semaphore for each fork around the table. Each value is initially one, indicating that only one person can use a fork at a time. And the indices of the forks in this array correspond to the indices of the forks around the table in this diagram. Now we represent each philosopher with its own process. So here is a function that is launched in the main function using this parallel begin statement. And we launch five philosopher threads with different ID numbers. So we have philosopher 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. And these correspond to the little subscript numbers of these philosophers in the diagram there. So what does a philosopher do? Well, this loop goes on forever. And the philosopher thinks for a while. And there's no telling how long this will take. And then when it's done thinking, it grabs one fork, then the other fork. I'll go into this in more detail in a moment. When it has both forks, it eats, and then it releases both forks. So sem weight means that the semaphore at that particular index is decremented, so the philosopher is claiming that specific fork. Now, the fork that is claimed is defined in terms of i. So the philosophers are numbered 0 through 4. And so philosopher 0 is going to claim first fork 0, and then fork 0 plus 1 mod 5. So mod 5 is the remainder via division by 5. This is often represented in C-based languages using the percent sign. So for philosopher 0, we need forks 0 and 1. And if we look at the diagram, that's what we see here. Philosopher 0 has fork 0 on one side and fork 1 on the other. Similarly, philosopher 1 would need fork 1 and fork 1 plus 1 mod 5, which is 2. In fact, the only reason for the mod 5 to be in there is because of philosopher 4. So philosopher 4 will claim fork 4 and then also 4 plus 1 mod 5, which equals 0 because the remainder of 5 divided by 5 is 0. So this modulus gives us a nice way of representing the fact that the table is circular. So essentially, all this code is saying is that after thinking for a while, 
a philosopher grabs the fork on the right, then the fork on the left, then eats, and then puts the forks back one by one. How can this lead to deadlock? Well, let's draw a resource allocation diagram to see. In fact, if we simply keep these philosophers as circles and then put each of these forks in a little box, then we can draw the diagram itself around this table. So because each fork is a semaphore with an initial value of one, there is only one dot inside each of these fork resources. And so let's say that we have these five philosophers executing at the same time. And remember that they always grab the fork on their right first. In other words, they grab the fork that has the same subscript number. So philosopher zero grabs and successfully claims fork zero. Now the next thing that this philosopher would attempt to do is grab fork one. But let's say that before that happens, philosopher one grabs that fork and thus claims that resource. At the same time, or close enough, fork two is claimed by philosopher two, fork three is claimed by philosopher three, and fork four is claimed by philosopher four. So every philosopher has picked up one fork. Now there are no forks left to claim. So when philosopher zero attempts to get fork one, we draw the arrow from the process to the fork to indicate that this resource has been requested but is not claimed. Similarly, philosopher one attempts to claim fork two or requests it. Philosopher two requests fork three. Philosopher three requests fork four. And philosopher four requests fork four plus one mod five, which is zero. And now we have a cycle in this directed graph. Hence we have deadlock. So the solution I showed you is no good. How can we fix it? So recall that even if you have all of the three conditions that make deadlock possible, it only occurs if you have a circular weight condition. So there is an easy way to reorder the fork requests that prevents a circular weight from occurring. So I'm going to cross out this incorrect part and we're going to fix this solution with a few simple changes. An easy way to make sure that a circular weight condition never arises is to have a global ordering of resources. So what this means is that any time that any process requests a resource, or rather a group of resources, it has to request them in the same order that any other process would. The problem with this current solution is that process 0 through 3 requests the lower numbered fork first. Process 0 requests 0 and 1, process 1 requests 1 and 2, and so on. But process 4 requests fork 4 first, and then 4 plus 1 mod 5, which is 0. That means that the order of fork requests here differs from the order being used by all other philosophers. The simple way to change this is to replace this internal i and this i plus 1 mod 5 with the following. So in the case of the first fork being claimed, instead of claiming fork i, we claim the minimum of i in i plus 1 mod 5. So if we are philosopher 0, then we are looking for the minimum between 0 and 1. So we're still getting fork 0. If we're philosopher 1, we're looking at 1 and 2. Philosopher 2 looks at forks 2 and 3. And 3 looks at forks 3 and 4. But philosopher 4 looks at forks 4 and 0. 
the minimum of those two is zero. So that philosopher will attempt to claim fork zero before fork four. Similarly, the second fork claimed is the maximum of those same two values. So the same two forks are being claimed, except we're always making sure that the one that has the lower subscript index or the lower array index is claimed first. Why does this global ordering prevent deadlock? If we go back to this diagram and think about how the resource request would occur with our modified code, we would see that this claim could not happen because process four, philosopher four that is, would need to claim fork zero before it could even request fork four. So that means that this claiming of fork four would not happen. This request would happen and then philosopher four would have to wait until philosopher zero was done. But because this edge is gone, it means that this request is transformed into a claiming of that fork. So the fork would be successfully claimed by philosopher three. And at this point, philosopher three has two forks, fork three and fork four. This means philosopher three is able to eat and will eventually give up both forks, at which point they'll be able to be claimed by other processes and the whole program continues and the philosophers get to eat without dying from starvation. So a very simple change to this code avoids deadlock. Now you could also change the order in which the forks are put back, but that's not really necessary. Now this is only one of many ways to solve the dining philosopher's problem, but a useful takeaway lesson from this is that one way to assure a circular weight condition will not occur is to have a global ordering of resources for all processes.